Hi, Gia. Welcome to our Green New Perspective Spotlight Series. Hi, how are you? Thanks so much for having me on. So can you tell our audience a bit more about yourself and more about the company and what inspired you to start it? Absolutely. So um, I was originally, grew up in Texas, originally was a chemical engineer by training um, from MIT. And, uh, but one thing that was a defining part of my childhood was uh, my father was very focused on climate change from a very early age. And so um, we grew up, I grew up learning about uh, climate change and, you know, some of the ways in which our energy system plays a real role in uh, that challenge. And the other part was around biodiversity as well. So we have, my brother's an avid fisherman, we spend a lot of time on water, and all of those things kind of came together for me uh, and my brother who co-founded Natel to focus in hydropower, which is this you know, interesting kind of forgotten renewable energy source that touches on a lot of points that resonate very deeply for us. So climate, energy, water, uh, and how we put those things together to create a more sustainable future. And can you tell me a bit more about the tech and the difference it's, it's making in the industry and for the environment? So hydropower has been around for a century at this point. Uh, it, we've, in the U.S., we have about 100 gigawatts um, of installed capacity today. Uh, about 80 gigawatts of that is, is what we think of as dispatchable generation. Um, uh, and 20 gigawatts is pump storage. So long duration, a lot of it is long duration storage. And while hydro is a great energy source, it provides the majority of the grid reliability services that keep our grid in the United States stable today. It is definitely an energy source that faces some unique challenges. So one is we have a very old fleet. The average age in the United States is 65 years. In Europe, it's 55 years. Globally, it's 40 years. So that presents a number of challenges where we have aging equipment and we need to upgrade that aging equipment if we're going to keep these generation resources online for another 60 years to be part of the energy transition. That's one challenge. The second challenge is around biodiversity and particularly around fish and fish passage. We've seen about a 75% decline in freshwater biodiversity since the 1970s, unfortunately. And while hydro is definitely not the only reason for that, it is a big part. It is a driver. It is definitely something because unfortunately about one in five fish um, are on average don't make it if they are going through conventional turbines. And so we saw a real opportunity to apply really good engineering principles to design high performance fish safe turbines. And that's what we do. Uh, really, that is very specific to the shape of the turbine blades. And, uh, and what we've developed over the last several years is basically a unique blade shape that combines a very thick leading edge. That thick leading edge, the way to think about it, creates a like pressure field that deflects. It's not an airbag, of course, because it's in water, but it helps deflect fish and debris around the blade instead of having a direct strike. And we combine that with a forward swoop of the leading edge as it goes from hub to tip. And the intuitive way to understand why that's important is if you've ever been on a merry-go-round and you're at the center of the merry-go-round, you're not moving that fast. But if you were out at the, at the outside edge, you're going quite fast. And so that slant helps us have a constant high survival rate from hub to tip because it means out at the tip, it's a glancing interaction, not a direct interaction. And that those two things combined give us over 98, 99%, in some cases, 100% demonstrated safe passage of fish moving through the turbine. And then the rest of the blade shape is optimized for traditional power performance metrics. Can you share some of the success stories? Over the last five years, I think charted a pretty fast pace. The first um, uh, idea or like the first you know, implementation in computer design, so in comp computational fluid dynamics, of this shape was done in early 2020. And we had tested a megawatt size blade uh, in a fish passage laboratory by the spring of 2020. We had our first project installed in Maine at the end of 2020. Our second project was installed um, the following year up in uh, Oregon. And then we installed our first project in uh, Austria, in Europe in 2022. So that kind of marked, marked a pretty fast path where we were doing a lot of science. Uh, we published four peer-reviewed papers in fisheries journals, kind of documenting in an independent way the science around the fish passage piece, which is really critical for the regulatory and environmental communities to, to see. Uh, and then we got you know, initial projects installed, 
And the last, I would say, two years for us has then really been moving into how we take the technology and really bring it to market at scale. And for us, that involves working with the existing ecosystem of turbine manufacturers. Again, Hydra has been around for 100 years. There's some very established manufacturers that do incredibly great work. And so what we do is we focus on the design and the innovation um, and the testing and demonstration, and then they build, our partners build the machines. And can you tell me what's the role of hydropower in meeting 2015 net zero targets? So what's fascinating is that if you look in the United States, I'll first just give a very concrete example. So in the United States, as we've seen a you know, rapid deployment of wind and solar um, in a, several different parts of the United States over the last decade and a half, that has been amazing to see. At the same time, we are increasingly aware of the fact that we need um, additional energy sources so that we can have round the clock reliable power. And hydro has been that in every grid in the United States where you have hydropower and natural gas, you can see them dispatching hour by hour, minute by minute in very similar ways because those are basically the two resources that we have that are the most flexible at large scale to provide that kind of grid reliability service. And that extends broadly. When you look in Europe, you look in Canada, you look in places um, really where you have hydro and natural gas are the places where you've really been able to see massive fast deployment of wind and solar without compromising grid reliability. And so as we look forward to 2050, um, right now we need to, the two challenges for the industry are we need to invest to upgrade, to keep the existing asset base that we have productive, functional, and able to meet that um, dispatch requirement to buffer out um, the intermittency of wind and solar. And at the same time, we need to build new. So it's estimated we need to do something like 20 gigs a year of new hydro. We are definitely not on track um, at this point uh, to do that. And so it's a substantial uh, uh, over a doubling of the installed hydro base that we need to achieve between now and 2050. And what do you think that needs to change to overcome that challenge? <laughs> <laughs> well, this, this this is a challenge. I mean, some of this is unique to hydro, and then some of this we face broadly um, in just the, how we actually drive the energy transition, and the specific obstacles are different in each geography. The U.S. is much going to be much more about really focusing first and foremost on upgrading the existing fleet um, so that we keep it online and we get more out of it. We, with modern technology like ours, not only can we address environmental issues like fish passage, but we also can just get more out of the assets. Um, and it's estimated that we can, you know, take, we can, of our existing footprint, we can probably generate 10 to 20% more megawatts just out of the existing asset base. So we need to do that, right? Cause that's, you know, call it, you know, 20, 20 gigs right there, just within the existing asset base. And, you know, in the context of how long it takes to get new projects interconnected these days, you're again now dealing with, assets that are already online, they're already interconnected, you know, they're in places where those additional, that additional capacity can be put to immediate use to support data center demand, uh, which is a big driver of, of load growth right now and other economic activity. So that's one keeping, which is upgrading the existing fleet. And we also need to unlock new build. And in the US, the kind of low hanging fruit there is taking our existing non-power water infrastructure. We have something like 90,000 dams that don't produce energy in the United States today. Um, most of those aren't going to be appropriate, to be clear, but about 13 gigawatts of new capacity could be unlocked just using existing water infrastructure. And then the kind of raw resource for new build is upwards of 65 gigs. There's, you know, and that number gets, there's quite a big range in terms of what depending on where you draw the line for, for technical feasibility, but kind of the low end of that 65 gigs. So we're going to need some of that as well um, as we look forward. If our audience wants to learn more about Mattel, where can they do that? Can you share some resources? Yep, absolutely. The easiest thing place to go is um, our website, which is natelenergy.com, spelled N-A-T-E-L energy.com. You look on there, you can see information about the tech, you can access our published papers, you can see videos of all sorts of fish <laughs> going through um, you know, our test turbines and, uh, and learn a lot more and feel free to get in touch with us at info at natelenergy.com. Thank you for watching New Perspective Spotlight series. If you like our content, please consider subscribing to our social media channel and follow our podcast on your favorite streaming platform. Thanks.